Hello, my name is Mika Armstrong, and I'm the longtime fiction editor at Guernica Magazine, online at guernicamag.com. I'm pleased to welcome you to the 2020 Brooklyn Book Festival. We're here today with authors Kelly Jo Ford, Kylie Reed, and Tracy O'Neill for the panel Trouble in Water. Before we begin, I want to let you know that the books by the authors in this panel can be purchased in the link below. We're first going to give you a sample reading of each of the authors, and I'll start with Kelly Jo Ford. Uh, Kelly is the author of Crooked Hallelujah, and she is a citizen of the Cherokee Nation of Oklahoma. She's a recipient of numerous awards and fellowships, including the Paris Review Plimpton Prize, the Everett Southwest Literary Award, and the Catherine Bakeless Nason Award at the Breadloaf Writers Conference, among others. Her fiction has appeared in Paris Review, Virginia Quarterly Review, Missouri Review, the anthology, 40 Stories, New Writing from Harper Perennial, and more. Visit her website at kellyjoford.com and follow her on Twitter at Kelly Jo Ford. Kelly Jo. Right off the bat, I was muted, but I was saying thank you so much, Meekin. Thank you. Um, Brooklyn Book Fest for having me. It's really great to be here. Um, I'll just I'll just jump in. I'm going to read from a story called Great of the Mask, uh, Strong of the Pool, and Crooked Hallelujah is a novel in stories. So, um, so this story is about a third of the way in. It takes place, um, which might be evident in in the early '90s, um, and I think it, it takes place in a fictional town in the Cherokee Nation, which is in the northeast corner of Oklahoma. We had the sneak to turn on the window unit mom bought from my, from my bedroom in Texas. Lula was so happy to see us. She followed mom and me from room to room, worrying about the electric bill, worrying someone might trip over the cord, and our favorite, worrying we'd catch cold. It had to be 100 degrees in there, but she insisted I wear a jacket because exposed skin was a sin or led to sin. I was never exactly clear on the reasoning behind holiness doctrine. At any rate, Mom and I had hardly unpacked our room and already Oklahoma July and Lula were bringing out our crazy. Justine and Rini, don't you just love these, Lula said. She dabbed sweat with a handkerchief and spread two ankle length skirts on the bed for mom and me. We'll go to a motel, mama, mom said. It was a threat. We're not wearing those skirts or taking out our earrings either, a dare. We'd come up to Lula's to stay a while or stay. We did that sometimes, left pitch in Texas and headed back to Indian country. Once we packed up all our stuff and drove all the way to Tennessee where mom's two sisters lived. I was hardly enrolled in my new school before mom and pitch decided they couldn't live without each other after all. Lula pursed her lips and got after a fly with a rolled up magazine. I mouthed be nice at mom, but she shrugged and passed a note that said, me and you plus 10 killer, 10 killer sunset tonight, cool deal? Then she turned to Lula and said, hey mom, let's make a grocery list. She motioned me out the door. When she came outside, waving her list and grinning, I was sitting in the driver's seat of her new used Mustang with the engine running. You must be crazy too, she said, and jerked her thumb toward the passenger seat. We ran by the truck stop for a six pack of baby beers and a Dr. Pepper, and then we were flying through town with the T-tops off and windows down. I pushed I do not want what I haven't gotten to the tape deck, but before Sinead could finish the serenity prayer, mom popped it out and put in 1999. We'd done a version of this the whole five hour drive from Texas. I'd put in some of my music and feel for a minute like I wasn't in a car sagging with the weight of half our lives. Headed to Lula's where there was no TV and the only records were Mahalia Jackson and Gospel Elvis. Mom gave everything a chance, but the Prince tape she had bought at our first fill up always went back in. She'd go right to Little Red Corvette and sing like the car was her shower and I wasn't sitting there so sick of Prince I could puke. Her whole life she had wanted a Corvette, but she was married to Pitch, or used to be, who could say. She had taken over payments on the Mustang before we left. The thing sounded like it had been run into the ground, but I think it had her thinking about possibilities again. The future, maybe. Please, can I drive when we get to the highway, I asked. I had my hips hovering over the seat, trying to zip the cutoffs I didn't dare wear at Lula's. Mom whipped her head around and downshifted. Before I knew what was happening, we were mid-U-turn, pulling into the filler-up parking lot. Rini, kill, she killed the car and took a big breath. Don't look, but there's your daddy. We bugged our eyes at each other. 
And then we started laughing. My father wasn't a wound or even a scar, not a black hole or a dry desert. He just wasn't, not for me anyway. Mom was my sun and my moon. I was her all too, and that was us. Her equal parts, beautiful optical illusion and fiery hot star. And me, an imperfect planet, she kept as close as she could. So when she pointed her lips at the man getting gas and said, don't look, but there's your daddy. It was Arsenio, not the nightly news. I got all tingly. I said, better late than never. Mom was still nervous laughing when she yanked the parking brake, but everything shifted in the evening swelter. A truck passed by with a one-two country bass pumping. The only sound was an occasional tapping coming from the tire shop across the street. I tried to smooth my hair and did my best to pull my shorts from my butt, wishing I was still wearing my jeans. A drop of sweat ran down my stomach into my belly button. Straining to see without looking, mom and I found each other's hands as we crossed the parking lot. Even from the opposite side of the gas pumps, I could see why I was so much shorter than mom and why people in Texas mistook me for a Mexican more than they did her. The guy wasn't much taller than the pumps and beneath his cut off denim shirt, his shoulders and arms were a deep reddish brown. He had a white cowboy hat and a big turkey feather sticking out of the band pulled low over his eyes. I nearly stopped in the middle of the parking lot trying to see his face. But then mom was pulling me through the jangly glass door and dragging me down an aisle with a clear view of the register. We stood there long enough for the lady at the counter to get to thinking we were stealing, which seemed pretty close to the truth of the matter. Mom thumbing through Slim Jims way too nonchalantly and me pretending to care about the ingredient list on a can of Pringles. Can I help y'all? The lady finally said and started moving around the counter to check on us. But before she made it, she yelled, hey, and ran for the door. Mom took off after her. I grabbed the Slim Jim she dropped and followed just in time to see that the man in the cowboy hat was now a man in a truck pulling away. A redheaded kid about my age with britches tucked into stupid pointy-toed boots met the lady at the door. 728 on pump two, ma'am, he said, all breezy. Like it wasn't 200 degrees outside, my alleged father hadn't just skinned the fuck out before I could get a good look at him. Suspicious, the lady looked from the water ones to the kid's face. Told me if I paid for his gas, I could keep the change. Important business, I guess, he said with a smirk. I was sure all that kid was going to do with the change was buy something he could huff into his blank brain. That son of a bitch, mom said. She pushed into the parking lot and shouted at the sky, I guess, because the man was down the road. Fuck you. I shoved the Slim Jim into my shorts and went after her. Motherfucking bastard, she shouted, which I only later understood to be irony. And I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next up is Kylie Reed. She's the author of Such a Fun Age. Kylie Reed is an Arizona native and a recent graduate of the Iowa Writers Workshop, where she was recipient, a recipient of the Truman Capote Fellowship. Her writing has been featured or is forthcoming in New York Times, Playboy, Plowshares, December, New South, and Lumina, where her short story was the first place winner in the 2017 Flash Prose Contest. Her New York Times bestselling debut novel, Such a Fun Age, is currently in development by Lena Waith's Hillman Grad Productions and Sight Unseen Pictures. Reed lives in Philadelphia. Kylie. Thank you so much. I'm just gonna dive right in. This wouldn't have happened if you had a real fucking job, Amira told herself on the train ride home, her legs and arms crossed on top of each other. You wouldn't leave a party to babysit, you'd have your own health insurance, you wouldn't be paid in cash, and you'd be a real fucking person. Taking care of Briar was Amira's favorite position so far, but Briar would someday go to school. Mrs. Chamberlain didn't seem to want Catherine out of her sight, and even if she did, part-time babysitting would never provide health insurance. So by the end of 2015, Amira would be forced off her parents' health, health coverage. She was almost 26 years old. Sometimes, when she was particularly broke, Amira convinced herself that if she had a real job, a nine-to-five position with benefits and decent pay, then the rest of her life would start to resemble adulthood as well. She'd do things like make her bed in the morning, and she'd learn to start liking coffee. She wouldn't sit on her floor in her bedroom, discovering new music and creating playlists until 3 a.m., only to put herself to bed and think, why do you do this to yourself? 
she'd try out a new dating app, and she'd have more interesting interests to write about, activities other than hanging out with Zara, watching old music videos, painting her nails, and eating the same dinner at least four nights a week, a crock pot meal consisting of shredded chicken, salsa, and cheese. If Amira had a real job, she'd look at her wardrobe full of clothes from Strawberry and Forever 21 and decide it was past time for an upgrade. Amira constantly tried to convince herself that she could find another child, a little girl with nice parents who needed her full time. They'd keep her on the books so she could say she paid taxes. They'd take her on vacations and consider her part of the family. But when Amira saw other children, anyone who wasn't Briar Chamberlain, she felt viscerally disgusted. They had nothing interesting to say. Their eyes had dead, creepy stares, and they were modest in a way that seemed weirdly rehearsed. Amira often watched Briar approach other toddlers on swings and slides, and they turn away from her saying, no, I'm shy. Other children were easy audiences who loved receiving stickers and hand stamps, whereas Briar was always at the edge of a tiny existential crisis. Underneath her constant chatter, Briar was messy and panicky and thoughtful, constantly struggling with demons of propriety. She liked things that had mint smells, she didn't like loud noises, and she didn't consider hugging a legitimate form of affection unless she could lay her ear against a welcoming shoulder. Most of their evenings ended with Amira paging through a magazine while Briar played in the bathtub. Briar sat with her toes in her hands, her face a civil war of emotions, singing songs and trying to whistle. She'd have private conversations with herself, and Amira often heard her explain to the voices in her head, no, Mira is my friend. She's my special friend. Amira knew she had to find a new job. It's up there. Thank you. Uh, finally, we have uh, Tracy O'Neill. Tracy is the author of The Hopeful, one of Electric Literature's best novels of 2015, and Quotients, published in 2020 by Soho Press. In 2015, she was named a National Book Foundation 5 under 35 honoree, long listed for the Flaherty Dunnan Prize and was a narrative under 30 finalist. In 2020, 2012, she was awarded the Center for Fiction's Emerging Writers Fellowship. Her short fiction was distinguished in the Best American Short Stories 2016 and earned a Pushcart Prize nomination in 2017. Her writing has appeared in Granta, Rolling Stone, The Atlantic, The New Yorker, and many others, including Guernica. Tracy. Hi. Um, okay, so I'm going to read from um, the middle of Quotients. Um, and the chapters are quite short, so I'm going to read two chapters, but we're not going to be here for, you know, an hour or anything. Alexandra had not yet made it from the airport to Murray Hill, where Robert and his wife Cassandra lived. Jeremy took the stairs two at a time, the smell of family dinners in the hallway, and at the door to the apartment held a bottle of wine in the style of demonstration. You made it, Cassandra said, wiping her hands on her pants to accept the bottle. What's cooking? Take this. It's an old family recipe. Toss the grapes in a crock, get your feet going with 50 others, and then it is a piece of cake. Robert never told me you came from vineyard stock, Cassandra said. Every man needs his secrets, Jeremy said. Do you drink red? I drink whatever color is in front of me. My good time gal, Robert said, coming from a deeper room and holding his wife's waist from the side so that their hips touched. It's bad luck standing in a doorway. Cassandra said, the devil takes in the, dis the indecisive. And what's more, there's cheese inside, Robert said. In the apartment, they leaned in various positions in the kitchen as the wine was poured, then moved into the living room, chewing on slices of manchego. There was public broadcasting television playing, and the screen shunted between pictures of men in fatigues and men praying, tanks and regional maps, and close-up shots of people with blurred out faces. Robert lit a joint, closed his eyes, blew out. He leaned back on the couch. PTSD treatment, he said, stretching the joint toward Jeremy. It doesn't count. Jeremy waved him off. What's the trauma today? Robert moved his laptop to show Jeremy a video, grainy and cast in green light. 
there was a cloth bag atop a torso, then there wasn't, a beheading. But why did you click? It was everywhere on cathexis. I was positively surrounded. Terrorism was all anyone was cathecting in today. I wouldn't know, Jeremy said. I don't participate in the 21st century. You don't feel like you're missing out? I don't. But if you don't cathect, it's like you don't even exist. You miss invitations. I don't know about that, Robert, Cassandra said. I happen to see two eyes and a nose myself. And you invited me here, Jeremy said. What more could I want? The boy could be heard on the baby monitor. Robert went for Wally in another room, returned with a child held over his chest. He was humming a song. It's a good thing you're not single, Robert said. He pressed his mouth to his son's stomach, kissed it. These days, I don't know a woman who trusts a man who doesn't connect. It is a good thing I'm not single, Jeremy said. You're like my sister Marissa, Robert said. Sensible, a smart dresser. Robert reached Wally overhead, a laugh. She thinks it's undignified to emote online. Meanwhile, Cassandra said emphatically. Meanwhile, she's a test subject for an experiment on virtual reality treatment for PTSD and claims the algorithm is a better listener than humans. Of course, what kind of person isn't ashamed to talk to a computer, if you ask me, Cassandra said. Maybe it works, Jeremy said. Cassandra cleared her throat, put her hands out in the manner of halting traffic. Norris is wonderful, don't get me wrong. Wonderful mother, wonderful kids, but she is too much once in a while and that's all, folks. I have nothing to hide, Robert said. I don't want to hide. I want my boy to grow up knowing it's fine for men to express feelings, that it's good to, that good men do. And that's marvelous you do, Jeremy said. Better you than I. A few minutes later, Alexandra arrived in a sleek black suit with small gold knobs in her ears. Cassandra's face bunched up with friendliness. Wally was crying, and she was bending her knees rhythmically and soothed as Robert poured another glass of wine. Cute shirt, Cassandra said. Alexandra emitted a startled, oh. Her eyebrows quirked and she seemed to search a moment. Cute phone, she said. Her face was turned to the baby and it looked to Jeremy like a falling building facade. Chapter 15. He did not know why today was different from any other, sadder, but he knew her palate and so they walked until ice cream. Under glass, the swirled peaks were pink and white and brown. Jeremy and Alexandra took large pleated paper thimbles, and in the night air, when she was done with her little cup and her little spoon, Alexandra began looking at her phone, walking blindly again. Tonight's stars Chang and Ang, you and your mobile. Who are these people interrupting us, and why is everything they say urgent? It isn't, she said, but the machine makes me compliant with communication. It isn't my fault. Jeremy disposed of the ruined paper. He looked at his wife standing away from the waste bin on her phone. She was taking it hard, the wait for the child. Their whole lives, it seemed, the waiting had run, and maybe it had, but he wanted to make his own hopes spill onto her, and he didn't know how. Berkowitz had the demon dog Harvey. You will say, the phone made me do it, he teased. Alexandra thumbed on, silent and busy in the eyes. They're so happy now, Jeremy said. Robert and Cassandra. Of course they are. They're reaping the benefits of social currency, Alexandra said. Robert says the baby has a party trick. They say the media and rub the baby's belly until it farts. It works for bureaucrats too, a joker already, a critic. Now everything that passes gas is a critic, Alexandra said. It's an intentional fallacy. Jeremy put his arm around her. She let him for a half block, maybe more. He was her eyes while she attended to her phone, let out all the discourse in her fingers. There was a ring around the moon indicating the presence of ice crystals, refraction, tiny mirrors glowing circumference into the sky. He wondered what she was typing, but he did not look at her hands. He decided to make a joke. He said, finally, everyone who passes gas is a critic. Only on cathexis. Cathexis doesn't afford neutrality, she said. I wouldn't know anything about that, Jeremy said. They're only proud. Social currency, or love, said Jeremy, because who hates parents? Jeremy shrugged, they're children sometimes, or they're friends, she said. 
Our daughter will come, he said. We'll be so happy. Look at Robert and Cassandra. We aren't Robert and Cassandra. We are far better looking, Jeremy said, and less religious. Our daughter, she said, losing track of the sentence, maybe testing the words. Hey. Um, for our discussion, I thought I'd keep it casual and uh, feel free to interrupt or just talk. In all three no uh, novels, I noticed that everyone has secrets and a need for privacy. They even spy on each other. In Crooked Hallelujah, the characters keep secrets to protect them themselves, like one character is pregnant and 15, and such a fun age, uh, someone checks out, puts on another person's phone to track them, and in quotients, we have uh, surveillance at a, a really professional level. Um, would you guys care to talk about that, the nature of secrets and spying on each other in your novels? Maybe start with Tracy, since yours is all about that. Yeah, I mean, this is this is very much a book that's um, about the way in which these characters are attempting to keep secrets, even at a moment um, at which it's almost impossible for them to maintain a real any real privacy under surveillance capitalism and um, the surveillance of the state. Um, and so I think that there is a tension that's being sort of created in this moment, right, where um, the characters, I think, are, are clinging in some ways even more to their secrets um, because they feel, secrets themselves feel so fragile and everything feels so unsafe. It feels like information will leak out at any moment and they don't know how that information will be used. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so in my novel, Such a Fun Age, uh, the uh, a woman named Alex Chamberlain is spying on her babysitter. And her mo method of spying is seeing her phone set up in the charger, and she never clicks into it. She doesn't have the code, but she taps it, and information comes up, and it becomes something that she loves doing. And so you know, it's funny when people read this, they say, oh my goodness, like that's terrible. She should never do that. That's so creepy. 100%, she should never do this. At the same time, we've all done that. We've all seen a cell phone light up and leaned over just to see what it says. Um, when I lived in New York, I live in Philadelphia now. If I'm on the train and someone gets a text, I want to know what it says. I have no contacts, but I want to know because I think that we're nosy people. Um, but this is a horrible thing to do to your employee. But what I think happens a lot of the time with especially within a you know, very broad world of white supremacy is that someone can say, oh, this is for um, you know, the safety of my child. I just wanna make sure that my child is okay. So it's okay that I cross this boundary because I wanna make sure that this is a person I want in my family. When really Amira should be able to do whatever she should be, wants to do when she's outside of work as long as she's doing okay within work. And you know, it's funny because um, there's a very racist incident that happens in the beginning where Amira is, is accused of kidnapping, but for the rest of the novel, she's struggling to get health care, which I also see as a very racially like violent act if you need to go to a doctor. And so, you know, if everything had worked out and, and Alex was her employer and, and if Alex became this person who was in charge of her health care, I think it's important to realize that if Alex ever saw her talking shit about her on her phone, that could be the difference between Amira receiving healthcare and not because she's venting to a friend. And I think that's a very scary place. So on one end, it looks like this innocuous, creepy thing. On the other end, when there's power and money and capital involved, a lot of damage can be done. Mm. Kelly, how about, you? how about yours? Sure. I think that um, the instance of secrecy that you mentioned, um, it's at the beginning of the book when Justine is, um, is pregnant and she's 15. She's in this very religious household. She lives with her mother and great grandmother. And she's keeping a secret there and she's keeping a secret to protect herself um, because she doesn't know what's, you know, I mean, she fears getting in trouble like through her mother and the church, um, which um, has its reaches in every aspect of the family's lives. Um, but I think what we're seeing specifically for that character there it is, is some of the beginning of her trying to do everything she can to take care of other people around her, even at her own expense. And so as much as that keeping that secret um, is about herself and simply not knowing what to do, she's living with a mother who she's described as having multiple nervous breakdowns um, 
which was kind of the language of the time. And I think now that we would look at that and say, she's living with a mother who's suffering from mental illness untreated. Um, and so I think she's also trying to protect her mother, um, her mother's like just straight up well-being as well as her mother's place in the churches, which is, which is kind of all that her mother has. So in this case, that, that secret is um, the beginning of really, I think what you see Justine carry through her life, which I think, you know, when you, when you, when you read the book and see how, how her life progresses, which is kind of the beginning of, of what breaks her down is this like determination to protect other people kind of at, at her cost. Um, yeah, that's how I see that those kind of secrets functioning and in, in that instance, I think in, in the book. Interesting. Uh, Kylie, in your novel, there's, you know, there's the grocery store cop incident, uh, the, the fear that uh, she's kidnapping a child. And just before uh, the, 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 the cop uh, interacts with her, uh, Amira asks uh, an innocuous question because she, quote, wanted him to hear the way she would talk. Could you go into this and please, if others want to join in, do so. The reason why I'm asking, I'm wondering about fitting in uh, this way I read it into a larger sort of white society and how you worked on that in the novel. Sure, yes. So when Amira is approached by a security guard who does not believe that the child should be with her, she thinks to herself, let me ask him a question like, oh, is this door closed? Because she wants him to hear the way that she can speak. And um, from the very Meaning she speaks well or something like that? There are so many things going, going into that moment, I feel. And, you know, I'll, I'll go back to an instructor at Iowa that really inspired me who uh, said, you know, you don't want to do safari tourism with your audience. And I completely agree with that. Um, as humans, we speak a number of different ways. Black women are, you know, very, very common in the way that they code switch from the way that they're talking to their friends, they're in an interview, they're in a grocery store, wherever they're in. And I think it does a disservice to the reader to explain, Amira wanted him to hear her speak like a white person, like, you know, a person who went to college. Yeah. Because I feel that I, as a reader, just want to be dropped into something. Uh -huh. And I also feel like it gets, helps us, you know, know our characters a little bit better. But I also feel like it's real to the experience. You know, as a black person, I don't walk into a white grocery store and say, okay, now you are, it's just natural. And it's just something that you've been conditioned to doing. Um, in that scene, it was really important for me to take Amir through every motion of that building tension. And I think when someone accuses you of something that you didn't do, it seems silly at first. And so uh, I wanted to go really slow and have her kind of say like, wait, this must be a mistake. But I also wanted her to have those, you know, very natural flight or fight reactions. In that moment, I think many black women would say, let me let him know that I'm not trying to make any trouble by trying to speak in a certain way. Yeah. How about um, your other uh, characters in Kelly, Joe and Tracy? Um, is it uh, about sort of fitting in to the larger, do you feel that there is that within your novel? Sure. I mean, I think you see from the beginning, um, Justine is trying to fit into the, the culture around them. And the Holiness Church really is so insular that, it, that I think that it keeps them separated from the rural white community around them, as well as, you know, a lot of what might be like traditional spiritual practices of the Cherokee community around them as well. Um, what I think that you see later on in the book is not so much them fitting in, but, but maybe, um, maybe just them being othered or, or not being seen. I think particularly when they move to the, the North Texas town, that's mostly white. Um, in the, the little bit that I read, um, it, you know, um, Rini, said, who's Justine's daughter, says that, you know, people think of her as Mexican because there's not a big native community in that area or certainly not, not visibly so. And at other points of the book you hear, you know, she ends up marrying a man who thinks of her as a Cherokee princess, um, you know, which is certainly like a, a, a cliche and a stereotype. Um, and then, you know, you hear a different character from from that town, who's actually Justine's father-in-law, referred to her derisively as that Indian in a way that he would do to her face as if it's funny, you know? So I think you just, you don't so much see them trying to fit in, it's just sort of see them in the world around them, you know, and, mm -hmm. and just see sort of daily, um, 
the you know the daily reality of their lives yeah i mean i think that in in quotients um you know alexandra is um an asian american woman um but there there's like you know her identity is intersectional and she also um grew up um you know underprivileged and um i think that this character in particular um, doesn't have a lot of self-knowledge. And so I'm not sure she's always able to sort of disentangle if she's doing things because um, it will sort of launch her from a racial stereotype or if it will launch her, um, you know, her social mobility, right? Um, and she's sort of trying to operate um, in an upper middle class milieu, but there's one point in which her estranged brother reappears in the novel and he's um, sort of giving her shit about her like middle class semiotics, you know? Um, and so, you know, he's like pointing out her, her bob cut and her sensible pantsuit. And, um, and the book, you know, you know, begins really, the first chapter begins with um, her inside of Alexandra's mind and her trying to be sort of very um, reassuring and unthreatening when she's in a meeting. And she can tell that um, the people in the meeting are um, trying to fix her features on a map is the way that I say it. Um, and I think that that's one of those moments in the book where um, I'm not sure if every reader will get that, but certainly I think that you know anybody who is either an Asian American woman or has spent much time around Asian American women will recognize that experience of, um, you know, people who uh, are maybe not Asian American uh, wanting to know immediately where um, the like one's ethnic origins um, are, right, or what one's ethnic ethnic origins are. So, um, so there are moments in in the book I think that the touch on it, but I'm not sure that Alexandra exactly is completely um, aware in the way that maybe um, the protagonist and uh, say Kylie's book is. Yeah. Uh, um, I was wondering about when you, uh, when you, all of you thought about, uh, chose to bring in race in a kind of explicit way. Uh, oh, I know it's there, but, uh, but there's an offhand, uh, remark in in uh, quotients when uh, the mother tells the daughter she has good oriental skin or um, it's uh, it's a key moment in such a fun age and in Crooked Hallelujah this uh, kind of I guess I'll just call him a dirtbag he calls the women in the novel uh, dirty Indians uh, was was there a choice that, that came in I'm gonna bring it in here or did it seem natural or just wondering. I mean, I, I think that for me, it, it felt like it was inextricable from some of these characters' experiences, but in terms of the specific moments at which um, it spread up, I mean, that's a little bit of a, almost a craft issue, right? So, um, you know, for me, for example, the moment that you brought up about um, this character, mother so that she's she's mixed race right she's half white and she's half um she's half asian american and um and so the the mother comments on her good her good oriental skin but you know it's in this moment where um she alexandra has brought jeremy home to meet her family it's christmas and this and i needed i, I wanted this moment to be very clear why she's sort of alienated from her family in some ways and really like a little bit lost and why it's so important for her to try to reconnect with her brother who she is estranged with um, and for there to be that tension um, you know in that moment so it's very you know it's partly about narrative demands right it being brought up at that moment um, specifically um, and there's another moment later in the book where um, Jeremy and Alexandra have adopted a child, and the child is um, is Chinese, and um, a woman in the park thinks that Jeremy, who's white and, and British, has kidnapped this kid, and he 
does exactly the wrong thing, right? It's like he has not gotten any of those lessons that, um, you know, <laughs> that Kylie's character has, right? So instead of thinking like, you know, how can I convey that I am his safe person, he just like picks up the kid and starts running, you know, running away, which, you know, makes him, you know, appear guilty to these other people at first. Um, and Alexandra is like exasperated with him afterward. Like, you know, she can't understand why he would do that, but um, he hasn't sort of experienced um, racialized suspicions before, even though he has experienced suspicions based on his former life working um, in intelligence. So, um, Tracy, I agree with so much of what you said, you know, in the instance you mentioned, Meekin, uh, the, the dirtbag boyfriend shouting the slur, um, you know, that was, that was also kind of just a, an issue of narrative and craft and what was happening in that story. That's the story that during which they leave the Cherokee Nation and go to North Texas and, you know, and that's one of the culminating events of, of Justine realizing that she needs to go and, and find the better life. Um, you know, and that's about leaving the comfort and, and, and safety of where Rini's grandmothers live and, and going to this little white town, you know, looking for a better life, but that's not how things turn out, you know, which is, you know, you gotta have trouble in the book. Um, and so there we go, that we take off. Um, but it's, I think it's an interesting question. Um, and I think often maybe white readers might come to, to, books by native authors and they're looking for kind of a, a lesson on you know like a sociological lesson or like um the history of a tribe and and things like this but these are characters who as i i think tracy you mentioned this they're they're not really you know they're they're characters who are who are disconnected from their tribe because of the way that they were raised and also because so they're not really self-aware about this sort of tribal identity or you know i mean um, you grew up in the Cherokee Nation, you know, you're, you're surrounded by Cherokee people, but they were never people. I heard David Troyer say this about some of his characters in one of his novels once, which is like, they didn't really sit around and wonder, like, what's it like to be Cherokee living today? You know what I mean? So they weren't, they weren't considering these issues of race explicitly, um, but you do see them experiencing, um, I, I think like what I, I guess sometimes explicit aggressions and sometimes microaggressions like throughout the course of their lives later as they get perhaps a little more comfortable and, and get a little older they do consider that identity and, and I think recognize what's what's lost um, in moving away and things like that but um, yeah I'll, I'll stop talking now. Um, yes I agree with everything being <laughs> said. Um, two things. One, you know, the question of like, when you go into it, how hard do you decide to go into these questions? Um, I stole this from someone and I have no idea who I stole it from, but I use it in every class that I teach. Um, I always start with characters and I pretend it is a triangle. Your story is a triangle and I pretend it has three levels to it. And the bottom one is people. I always start with people with this story. I was really obsessed with having a really awkward relationship between three people because that's one of my favorite things to watch, whether it's a rom-com or, or anything else. Um, and so I start with people. The middle category of the triangle is conflict. Like Kelly Joe said, something has to happen. You have to have something going on, whether it's a tornado or it's an audition, whatever it is, something has to happen. And then the tiny triangle at the top of the triangle to me is symbolism and themes. And that is where race and class and privilege and all of those things come in. And I feel that if you take that triangle and you tip it over and you try and start with race, it's going to fall. You can't go into a story saying, I'm gonna write about how slavery is bad because slavery still exists today in many different forms. And so it's like, what are the people you're working with saying about how slavery shows up in their life? And at that point, you might as well just get obsessed with the people because you're gonna be working with them for a really long time and, and you gotta love them no matter what. Um, as far as the novel is concerned and, and where race shows up, um, you know, it's, it's interesting because I think that what happens is there's, there's so much white material and then works of color come out and, and 
often white and black readers will say, oh, like this moment is about race. But then when she's with her friends, like that's not about race. Amira is just as black when she's standing up for herself in that grocery store as she is when she's trying to ignore someone saying the N-word. Um, I think disassociating and protecting yourself often and saying, you know what, I'm going to pretend like I didn't hear that, that's just as big a part of, of the Black experience as, as anything else is. And so, you know, as an artist, you do not get to choose the way that people approach your art, and that's what makes it art, but all you can do is, is tell the truth and show where those things pop up. And I would also say, last thing I promise, that, you know, the way that race affects Mira, Amira sometimes is less than the way that her class affects her. Every decision from the way that she speaks to her hair, to her clothes, um, you know, the way that she does her makeup, all of those things are shaping the way that people approach her. And some of those things filter into each other. Some of those things make people see her as more black than they thought she was. Um, and I think it's important for me to make sure that I'm not just approaching this as a, a black woman. It's a woman who's a little bit shy, who sometimes she can communicate, who stays up too late, who hates coffee. All of those things are, are making her who she is. Yeah. Yeah, I loved, uh, I loved her world and when she was with her friends, uh, which uh, you, uh, and it, it was almost as if, uh, and I'm, I'm segueing to the next question, uh, it was almost as if uh, she, it's not a withdrawing from the world or anything like that. It's just that she has her own world and uh, these other people, they, they're they sort of intruding in some way, the larger world. and. But the question I wanted to ask was, um, in Crooked Hallelujah, there's uh, the Cherokee identity, but there's also the Holiness Church. And uh, there's this idea of a drawing from the world and being a worldly, which I take it is, is sinful to be worldly. Um, can you talk about that, Kelly Joe? And I'm interested uh, in the idea of a drawing from our, uh, society to keep yourself. And also with your other, um, with the other authors, like there, there, that also seems to be a part of it. Uh, it's not like you're trying to join that world. It's like you already have your world and, and how are you going to keep that? Sure. Yeah. So, and you know, the, the, the question of faith and this holiness identity, I, I really think that that's, um, that's something that is, you know, in some ways it's a bigger influence on these, these characters' lives and like the question of like Cherokee identity uh, in, in a lot of senses because I think that um, Justine in particular is haunted by the way that she was raised because I think when you're raised in, in such a religion and you're told that there's only one, one way to live um, and one way to experience, you know, like a, a good afterlife and then you're rejected by that religion because she gets pregnant at 15 and essentially is told that it's, it's disgraceful for her to be in the church. Um, she was probably, she was on her way to rejecting the religion anyway, but who knows, she might've come back around, you know, she was a rebellious teenager. Um, and so she carries this, this, she, she carries this um, question of kind of essentially like, it's not really explicitly stated, but you know, is she, is she going to hell for the choices she's made? Um, throughout her life. She can never quite, quite shake it. But I think in great part, it comes from being raised in such an insular community. Um, and that, that church does, um, you know, con th consider the outside world worldly. And, and Megan, you said, which you, you assume means sinful. And yes, but maybe not in the ways that you or I might like assume, um, because I think that, um, maybe there's a fear that if people from the church associate with people, make, make friends with people outside of the church, you begin to like, I don't know, maybe you go to a football game or, you know, <laughs> and, and you see like, you know, you just do like teenage stuff. And um, then there's this lure to, to step outside, but you know, Justine as a teenager, teenager, she can't even play basketball. Um, it's, it's that kind of religion. She has to wear dresses. She can't go to football games or take part in, in, in basketball games. Um, so I think it's a form of, it's sort of like fear and protection. Um, and, and living in that environment, I think makes Justine naive in a lot of ways and makes her rebel, um, begin to rebel much harder than probably she ever would have. Um, and the choices she makes, the, the kind of people she's attracted to and, and things like that.
Yeah, I'll speak to those different worlds a little bit. Um, you know, I'm a really big fan of having boundaries within your work world and your and your home life. And for for so many Black Americans, the work world is the more white world, and there is a certain laugh you do. There's a certain you know you know everything is a little bit different there. But you know, just in my uh, in my work when I was teaching at the University of Iowa. I love teaching so much that I like having a boundary with my students. And so in class, I'm Miss Reed. And then obviously at home, I'm just Kylie. Um, and I think that I wanted to use those ways in these two different worlds that you're in. You know, Amira just calls Alex Mrs. Chamberlain. Even though she tells her, you can call me whatever you want, she still continues to call her that. About, but Alex still tries to get them to be you know, friendlier than they are. She doesn't understand that Amira is like, she leaves every day, right when her, she wants to clock out, she calls her Mrs. Chamberlain. That's the, you know, the relationship that she wants to her. And that's the relationship I believe that she should be able to have with her as well. Those two worlds, I think it's okay that you don't want one to slip into the other one. Um, I think, you know, I, I'm going to butcher it, but James Baldwin has a really great quote about it, about how for many white people, it's, you know, Black people are othered in this way that's like, oh, it's so interesting, it's so cool, I want to know more about it. But for Black people, it's like, I, I already know you because I'm in your world. I, I read your literature, I go to your stores, I'm in your school, I try to, if I'm going to be successful, I have to be successful within your world. Um, and a very tiny but important example, you know, every Black hairdresser I've ever been to, which is too many, all know how to do white hair. Every single one of them know how to do white hair gorgeously, but I've never been to a white person who knows how to do black hair. That is the difference. And you just, as a black person, you have to understand that, do you want to be comfortable? Do you want to have quality of life? Okay, well, this is a part of, you know, this world that you need to be fluent in. And so I didn't want to spell those things out because I think it's just a natural reaction. And I'm sure there's so many ways that I, I do that now that I don't even notice. Um, but Amira's 25 and she's just bare bones. She's just like, I need a job. Let's do this. And, and this is where she's at. Um, Megan, could you, <laughs> Megan, could you repeat the question? It's, uh, I was wondering about the need to withdraw from the world to keep yourself or, or in your case, privacy, uh, you know, because you have so much surveillance, uh, something along those lines. Um, yeah, I mean, in, in quotients, um, I think that the characters do very much often want to withdraw into um, the world of individuality um, in, in the sense that um, they feel that their places in um, a larger society are, are far more tenuous. So one of the characters that um, we haven't really met, I guess, in this event a while, um, you know, is a journalist and he's very, he's very, very aware of um, being perceived as a failure. And so um, there's a way in which I think all of these characters are in pursuit of a haven from being perceived, right? Because to be judged, you have to first be perceived, right? Or um, to, to be sort of miscategorized in a certain way, one has to first be perceived. And so, um, they're all sort of looking for that. None of them really find it. <laughs> it's a little bit bleak in that sense. Um, but uh, yeah, yeah. Okay, that sounds good. Um, I think uh, that, would, that would be uh, it for the, our questions. Thank you, Kelly, Joe, Tracy, and Kylie. Everyone, please remember you can order books in the link below. And please consider making a donation to the Brooklyn Book Festival which is celebrating its 15th uh, year of presenting free literary programs. Thank you. Thank you. This is so fun. Thanks. Bye. Nice Bye. to meet Kylie and Kelly.